Very good. Super, thanks, Dave. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, we're going to just have a bit of fun this morning, I hope. And we're going to try and sort through how we get high yield wheat, right? By the way, as I think most of you know, I'm a big Twitter guy. And I'm at Wheat Pete. This is how you get a hold of me, by the way, if you, uh, now that I'm independent, it's peter.johnson at bell.net. If you fire me an email, I'll do my best to get back to you. I'm not guaranteeing anything, but uh, certainly will try. But I am a big Twitter guy. How many people on Twitter? <laughs> Holy Lord, do I have my work cut out for me already this morning. What do you mean you haven't got time? Man, what is wrong with you people? Twitter is an amazing agricultural tool. And by the way, I've got almost as much gray hair as most of you do. And it's just one of those things that has incredible potential. So a couple of examples. One, I had a grower that uh, 30 foot air cart pulling behind a, a twin tank. All of a sudden, air cart would not go up and down. The unit would not go up and down. It's the, I don't know, 7th of May rain's coming he's got to get the beans planted he's pushing and now he's stopped dead he tweets out that the 1790 won't go up and down within five minutes he's got five different answers for what might be the problem three minutes later he tweeted back he was up and running and it just is incredible from that standpoint another example the how many guys grow soybeans i know you grow wheat you should grow soybeans right so yeah, we're driving home, we stop at a soybean field, and we go in and we scout the soybean field, and guess what we find? Aphids, right? Yeehaw, just what we wanted to know. Tweet out, we found soybean aphids in the research plots at Arva, and what does that do for you guys? Shows up on your smartphone right away, and it, you're out busy spraying your corn or whatever, and it says to you on the way home, for goodness sakes, check your soybean field. And if you got aphids, you go spray. So get on Twitter. I was, by the way, going to tell you that you guys are doing an incredible job here in the US because you're number three, you're kicking our butt. But I'm not gonna tell you that anymore because there was only three hands that went up that said they were on Twitter. <laughs> so get with the program. Uh, it's absolutely, it's an agricultural tool. I never thought I would say that. Facebook's, I don't know, that's for grandmas because then they can watch their grandchildren grow or whatever. But Twitter, yes, sir. I still know how to write a letter. Yeah, you still know how, you know what's wrong with writing a letter? You're abs it takes a week to get there. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely, yeah. or if I call up the, the local paper and I put the, there's aphids in the local paper, it'll take two weeks before you find out. Get with the program, this is a great deal. It's just one of the things you should do. So we wanna talk about high yield wheat. And, you know, I don't care if you're red or green or whatever. I expect you're like most of the people in Ontario. You all wear green underwear, right? It's just John Deere or nothing. It drives me crazy. Anyway, we want to get there. How are we going to do that? So where are the world's highest wheat yields? Where do you think? England. Bingo. Who said New Zealand? Man, if I had a prize, you'd win. Why New Zealand? England, by the way, grows very high wheat yields. Ireland actually grows higher wheat yields than England does. Uh, Northern Germany does pretty well as well. Why? Weather, absolutely, weather. But nonetheless, I really think that, that we should sort of go through the thought process. If they grow the highest wheat yields, we want to grow high wheat yields, we should go through that thought process and see if we can figure out how to do what they're doing. So here is the highest wheat field, uh, highest yielding wheat field in the world. It is in New Zealand. How high is the yield? 2010, Mike Soleri set the world record. How high? Anybody? 233 bushel per acre. I got to harvest wheat off a hectare to get that kind of yields, right? You guys don't even know what a hectare is. It's two and a half acres. <laughs> Did it all lodge? No, that, it's unbelievable. I mean, most of you guys would be pretty pleased if you got a corn yield of 233, and he's growing 233 wheat. So we really do have a lot more yield potential 
than what we're, what we're getting to. So what determines yield potential? Weather, yeah. What's your number one job as a farmer? Weed control. Oh, good. Christy, where's Christy? She'll be, yeah, wait, yeah. Aren't you smiling now, Christy? You, you are the person. Yeehaw. Weed control. Your number one job as a farmer is to harvest the sun. Yeah, you need some rainfall as well, but that's really your number one job is to harvest the sun because that's what it's all about, right? And so what happens, or how do we harvest the sun? There's a whole bunch of things that come into play. I can't use my pointer because it, uh, there's three screens, but, but really there are some key points about this. When you're trying to harvest the sun, this is way too complicated. I don't expect you to follow through this and, and really understand it very much. But the efficiency of light interception is a key point. So the more efficient you can be at intercepting light, the higher the yield's going to be. How efficient is wheat at intercepting light? 1.2%. That stinks, right? That's brutal. Corn is 3%, solar panels are 10%. Now mind you, solar panels are making electricity. If you took that electricity and tried to turn that electricity into food, which by the way they can do, then the efficiency would drop even below 1.2%. But we're not very good from that standpoint. So we really have to try to figure out you know, how, how we can capture that sunlight better, how we can drive that whole process better. So what are the components of yield? What do we have to strive for? And we really are looking for the number of heads per square meter per square yard for you guys. We're also looking for the number of grains per head. And this is where they really kick our butt in Europe and in New Zealand and in the places with high yield. They get a lot more grains per head and they also get a lot more weight per grain. So we're really trying to drive that head, right? That's how we're trying to get there. So then we go to the UK and we kind of think, what happened in the UK to give them the big yields that they have? And when we look at that, it's, a, it's an interesting story. If you go back to 65, and the bottom line, by the way, are the yields for US wheat. So the bottom yellow uh, dot black line, that's how much your yields have increased compared to how much the UK yields have increased. Which line do you like better? Yeah, I think you guys have a ways to go, right? Absolutely, so do we in Ontario. So how did they do it? Well, the first thing you need effective herbicides. Whoever said weed control, yes, talk to Christy, we have to have good weed control. It's actually way more important in the UK for weed control than it is here, believe it or not. And there's some reasons for that, but we need effective herbicides, semi-dwarf varieties, because the wheat has to stand. If the wheat flops over, we don't get big yield. We need fungicides. And we need fungicides primarily because we have to keep the plant healthy enough to utilize the sunlight, to utilize the moisture, and to use the nitrogen that we put on. So that's another key. And then we increase the nitrogen. And I will show you in the second talk how much those two particular things interact. They are incredibly interrelated. One does not work without the other, and that's kind of a cool thing. But using that, average yields actually doubled in the UK from 1960 or 1970s to the mid-1990s. They doubled wheat yield. That's pretty impressive, right? So I think there's something to management to try and drive this wheat yield higher. So here's what we have to try and do. Notice the temperatures there. Wheat is a cool season crop. The graph is for London, Ontario. That's 43 degrees north latitude. Uh, we're just about that here. We might be a little bit further north, but this is essentially the way where, where you guys are at as well. Notice the cool and comfortable range. Those are the important temperatures. So wheat grows best at 18 degree days and 10 degree nights. 
Any time the temperature goes, oh, sorry, I'm talking, I'm a Celsius guy. I've got to remember I'm in the U.S., my apologies. Wheat grows best with 65 degree days and 50 degree nights. If you could hold the temperature that, that all the time, you would have amazing wheat yields. It's okay from 65 to 75, but every day it goes over 70 degree, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, you lose a bushel per acre per day in yield. That's a lot of yield, right? And by the way, if ever it goes over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, essentially the wheat plant goes into shock, heat shock. And it will just really suffer from those kind of temperatures. It just almost shuts down because it, it's not able to stand those temperatures. So given that, what kind of things are you going to try to do to maximize that? And what you really want to do is you want to try to get grain fill into that period where we have the light green and the yellow. I'm sorry, the colors aren't showing up that well on the screen. I apologize for that. I don't know if these other screens are any better or not, but uh, yeah, that screen's better. Yeah, so what are you going to do to try and get that wheat to have its grain fill period in those cooler temperatures? And that's pretty simple. You're going to try to shove heading earlier, right? Because the earlier you go, you can see that you push it back into those better temperatures. And that's what we're trying to do or one of the things. So conditions during grain fill are critical. We need bright but cool days. We need that sunshine. What's really intriguing, and I don't want you to get lost in this graph, it's way too much information and I apologize for that, but I just really like what it has to say. So as you look at that graph, notice that in Ontario, in Michigan, you guys are the same, how many days of grain fill do we actually get? 34. How many days of grain fill do you get with corn? Anybody know? Think about it. When does corn tassel? When does it black layer? How many days in between? Yeah, 60 days, give or take. We get 60 days of grain fill with corn. Is it any wonder that wheat won't yield with corn? And the answer is no, because we need more days of grain fill. So you get a cool year and you get an extra day or two of grain fill, we actually get more grain per day than they do in New Zealand or the UK because we have more solar radiation. So we're gaining 4.3 bushels per acre per day if we can extend that grain fill even one day. And so you get two or three extra days of grain fill, you just picked up another 12 bushel per acre. And that's not a bad deal for doing nothing. So it really is kind of intriguing. Uh, the other thing, by the way, you'll notice is that we are not, in terms of potential yield, yeah, we don't do very well compared to them. And that's because we get into heat shock. And once we go into heat shock, then it shuts down too early. So what does wheat want? It wants solar radiation. It wants a long growing season. It wants moderate winters and summer with no excessive summer temperatures. And it wants moisture. So let's just quickly run through where are we at compared to the high yield regions of the world. And so that's solar radiation for Ireland for Cambridge, for New Zealand, and for Ontario. Michigan would be the same. I didn't bother to go back through and try to, try to draw the Michigan curve because I know it would be the same. Of course, Christchurch, New Zealand is in the southern hemisphere, so that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So we correct for that, and we put uh, Christchurch into northern hemisphere. And look at that. The highest wheat yield area in the world gets just about exactly the same solar radiation as we do. If we could figure out how to get that long grain fill period, we could actually, you know, out yield them. If you look at our average temperatures, that's the kicker. So there, that little bit of difference is all that's making it so that we don't get high yield wheat. And that's a bit of a frustration, but that's life. And then you can just see, look at the difference between Cambridge and Michigan, if you will, in terms of the amount of the growing season that is in that cool and comfortable period. So that's the difference. So where do we go with that? Oh yeah, one other thing. By the way, you all think that, that the UK, Britain is wet. 
it's actually a very dry climate. So they get about two inches of rainfall per month. So does New Zealand. Those are the highest yield regions. We get about three inches of rain a month. Not quite, but, but both uh, Michigan, Ontario, and, uh, and Ireland all get more rainfall. So we are not nearly as rainfall limited as the high yield regions, which is kind of intriguing, right? Of course, then if you have less rainfall, you probably have less disease, right? If you have less rainfall, you have less disease. Try to tell that to a Brett. They have septoria problems out the yin-yang. They have septoria that's resistant to all the fungicides. Uh, so, so remember, it's not just about rainfall, it's about how the rainfall comes. How does the rainfall come in the UK? It's just stinking misty there every doggone day. Right? I've been there in June, it was 19 degrees, which is perfect for wheat. And I stood out on the shore of the North Sea and it was misty rain, 19 degrees, and the wind blowing off the North Sea. And I wore every piece of clothing I'd taken with me because it was June. I didn't think it'd be cold, and I was still freezing my butt because it's just always damp. So they have way more problems from a, a disease standpoint than we do, way, way more. So what are the yield limitations? Well, in the, in the UK, oh, I can't use the pointer. Duh. In the UK, you can see that they actually have less plants per meter squared. They have 450 plants per meter squared. We have six, or not plants, rather, heads per meter squared. We have 650 heads per meter squared, which is essentially a square yard. You, pretty much a meter squared and a square yard, and it's not quite. So a meter squared is, is uh, just slightly bigger than a, than a square yard, right? But it's pretty close. Anyway, they have less heads per meter squared, but they get 50 grains or 50 seeds in a head. We get 35, that's on a good head. They have a 1,000 grain weight of 50 grams. We're about 35 grams. And so they're just packing more carbohydrate into that kernel, right? They're getting more kernels on the head. And one of the things their breeders have been really, really good at is making the wheat head more fertile, getting more seed set on the wheat head. And that's, from a breeding standpoint, we should try and, and follow that. So, observations. We want as long a growing season as possible. We're gonna get into some little bit better stuff. How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna get a long growing season? Management. I mean, all the stuff I've talked to up to this point, you should all be yawning and going to sleep and say, why did they bring this Yahoo from Ontario in? Because he hasn't given me one good piece of information yet. Nothing I can do. How are you going to do that? Bingo. Thank you. Absolutely. So we are going to plant early. Right? And if that is the key message you take home today, uh, I'm a winner. Because I can't give you anything better. And this is my, the standard graph that I always show when I'm talking about planting early, and it's pretty much a straight yield down, right? It's kind of interesting that I can plant wheat in January, and it will still make a crop. It's also kind of interesting that if I plant, oh, I can't, if I plant winter wheat, Vienna is a winter wheat, if I plant winter wheat on the 24th of January, it still out yields spring wheat even though the spring wheat was planted on the 24th of January. There's some reasons for that, but it's just kind of intriguing. But it's a straight line decrease. So plant early. So is it planting date? Is 1.1 bushels per acre per day. And so you guys that are growing soybeans, and you're growing soybeans that are full season because you want to maximize your soybean yield, what have you done to your wheat yield? You just killed your wheat yield. So you cannot be a record holding soybean grower and a record holding wheat grower at the same time. Can't happen. And I think you have to go through the thought process that maybe if you're going to grow soybeans and you want to be a good wheat grower, you've got to shorten the soybeans up because you gain it in wheat yield. And so do the math. You can do the math yourself. Yeah, you give up. Uh, 
I don't know, you give up probably three bushels per acre on soybeans to go to a short season soybean that you would harvest on the 20th of September versus a full season soybean that you would harvest somewhere late October. So on the other hand, you can gain 20 bushels a wheat. Would you rather have three bushels of soybeans or 20 bushels of wheat? It's up to you. By the way, this, this bushel per acre per day is far more critical in the early development, in the early planting stage, than it is during the late planting stage. And so it's really not one bushel per acre per day. It's a bushel per acre per day around September the 20th, but by the time I get to October the 20th, it, it takes five days to make a bushel. And that's because it's all related to heat. When, it is, when is it the hottest? It's the hottest in September, right? By the time you get to November, you wish you were all done harvest and you wish you were all done planting and at your vacation house in Florida because it's that cold. So it really isn't just a bushel per acre per day. It really comes down to about uh, somewhere in the range of 30 growing degree days makes a bushel. And this, just, this chart just shows you that a day is not a day. You can see on the 5th of October, we got about 100 and I don't know what that was, 108. Uh, we planted on the 21st of October. And look at the yield hit that we took. Like, unbelievable. Now that's also because when we planted the 21st of October, then we got pounded with rain. Anytime you get pounded with rain, you're sort of in a bad, bad way from any crop, right? But notice that whether I planted on the 21st of October or the 16th of November, there was very little yield difference because when you go late, then you just don't get any development anyway. It's, it's just such a slow progression. So the yield loss associated with late planting is way bigger early than it is late. And by the time you get to October the 20th and you're saying, well, I got to get the weed in early and so I got to plant in the mud even though it's really not fit, ah, wait another five days because the, lo the loss is in inconsequential and you're way better off to plant into good soil conditions than you are to push the planting date that late. Figure out how to get it in early will help. So is it planting date or is it date of emergence? It's date of emergence, absolutely. So it's not just planting date, now it's date of emergence. What impact does that have? So the deeper you plant, the slower it is to come up. And that's just a pictorial, I don't want to make it too complex, but for every inch deeper that you plant, it takes an extra 50 growing degree days to emerge. Growing degree days are not a hard concept. It's for wheat, it's high temperature plus low temperature divided by two. So if I have a day that's 15 degrees in the day, five degrees at night, oh, I'm Celsius again. <laughs> anyway, it adds to 20, I divide by two, it's 10. And yes, these are Celsius growing degree days. Uh, I will, uh, where's Jody? Jody, I promise I'll try, I'll try to, to uh, make those into Fahrenheit for you before you post them on the website. My apologies. I changed most of them, but I obviously miss, missed a few. In any case, you get the sense of the deeper you go, the slower it is to, to emerge. So is planting depth important? How many people plant wheat? Put up your hand. You're all lying. Every one of you seeds wheat. You don't plant wheat. You use a corn planter to plant wheat? Not a stinking chance. Well, okay, I see one guy saying yes he does. Okay, I lied. There's one guy that was telling the truth. So this just shows, you know, that's my pictorial, but it, this actually shows you the difference in planting depth and how it impacts where you're at in terms of plant development. You can see the one on the right-hand side planted two and a half inches deep has got way less plant than the one planted an inch deep there in the middle. And so planting depth is important. Uh, by the way, you can't put it on the soil surface. Well, you can, but it, it's not going to work very well. It'll emerge fast, but then of course it's going to frost heave and you've got to have enough moisture. So you really need to get the wheat plant planted a minimum of one inch deep, minimum one inch deep, because the crown roots and you can see that on this, on this chart, and I apologize, I should have put a line in, 
uh, there, there is, if you draw the one inch line, notice where the nodal roots are developing on every one of those plants, right? You can quite clearly see that the nodal roots, no matter how deep you plant, they develop about three quarters of an inch to an inch. Why do they do that? Because the trigger for the nodal roots, the roots that hold it in the ground, that the plant feeds on for the rest of the year, they are triggered by when the coleoptile sees light. So you can plant the wheat plant six inches deep, the nodal roots still set at three quarters of an inch to an inch. You always want them as deep as you can get them, so you can't plant shallower than an inch. And of course, then we have this thing called drills. And this, you know, I'm not green. I do not wear green underwear, but this, this is absolutely the best of the worst. <laughs> That's true, it's the best of the worst. I mean, all these drills are nothing but controlled spill devices. They just spill out the grain, but at least with this particular unit, you are sensing the depth right beside where the seed goes in the ground. If you have a Great Plains drill, and you're sensing the depth out behind, or a tie drill, or whatever, there's no way you can get uniform depth. It just can't happen. And so I really think that if you want to move agriculture forward, do me a favor. They developed the Maximerge planter in 1971, John Deere, with the wheels on each side, and then Kinsey came up with a better idea where they oscillated. And if you set that thing at two inches deep or an inch and a half deep, whatever, every seed should be at an inch and a half deep. Even with this John Deere drill, when I set it at an inch and a quarter, I have seeds at half an inch and I have seeds at inch and three quarters. And that's just the way they work. You want to move it forward, build a better drill. Does it make a difference? Every time I walk into a wheat field and I look at the size of the wheat heads, they're not uniform. Part of that is because they did not emerge uniformly. I mean, I said it's a bushel per acre per day. If I get one that emerges on the 1st of October and one that emerges on the 6th of October, those plants have different yield potentials. And corn shows it the best. So this is kind of the difference you get with corn when you don't have uniform emergence. Wheat is a similar beast. I can't show it to you in wheat because it's just, it's tough. But this gives you a bit of a, a concept. If you plant too shallow, it's not good, right? You get frost heave. Do those look like very healthy plants? I think the answer is no. So we don't want to plant too shallow. 95% of my problem calls in the spring are because the wheat was planted too shallow. And I find that pretty intriguing, but that's, that's just the way that it works. So that's uh, sort of like taking off with uh, one, one engine on fire. And just some trials that actually uh, were done at uh, Owensburg, back uh, Phil Needham and, and that uh, Wheat Tech group, I think, were the people that actually did this, this study originally. I think that's probably unusual. Well, actually, I know it's unusual that you would get that much yield difference in planting date. I mean, there's 10 bushels there between an inch and two inches. I think that's extreme, but it does drive home the point that we got to get better at this if we really want to do the job. In Europe, by the way, uh, they use crazy tillage, but they have drills that will put every seed in an inch, and they look for perfectly uniform emergence. So it is something to focus on. And then, of course, you get the other end of the spectrum. What's going on here? Cover crop, oh gosh, wheat is a cover crop. Hey, do, you, do you talk to the guys in Ontario or what? Yeah, it's not a cover crop. Uh, one, of my, one of the guys I work with dry, drove past, he was out there drilling wheat. It happened to be a dry fall. Maybe you go, don't get them in Michigan, but planting early, it was a dry fall. He was planting his wheat just like I told him, had the drill set for an inch and a quarter. The problem is it was dry at an inch and a quarter. So yes, I want you to plant at that inch, which means with a drill you set the depth for inch and a quarter, but you must get into moisture. And I don't care how deep you go, we set them down to almost uh, a little over two inches. That's what they looked like. It did finally rain, but I came back to the, that field later and dug up plants. 
The one on the, on the right you can see was planted very deep. And look at the good development, got tillers and everything. The one on the left was the stuff that was planted an inch and a quarter into dry soil. It rained 10 days later, whatever. You got to get to moisture. That's not rocket science. Ooh, that doesn't show up very, very well. I apologize. Um, I hope it's only the one screen. Anyway, the other thing that, that I think it's not just, uh, uh, it's not, yeah, that's much better there. It's not just depth, but it's also temperature. And I just find this chart pretty intriguing because you can plant 15 centimeters, by the way, is six inches deep. I can plant six inches deep, top right corner. It takes 11 days to emerge at 20 degrees Celsius, which is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. If I plant an inch deep, which is the uh, bottom, or pardon me, the, the column on the left hand side, and I plant or pardon me, that I have the temperature, so now I'm at 50 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, it takes exactly the same length of time for that wheat crop to emerge. So it's temperature as well as planting depth. And how do we manage temperature? How do we manage temperature? Well, man, you got to do a good job of residue spread. If you can't do a good job of residue spread, what's the temperature differential when you plant into a situation like that. You've got lots of temperature where there is no residue, and you've got very low temperatures where the residue is, thick, or is thick. rather. Plus, you've got wet soil where the residue is thick. If you want a uniform wheat crop, and you need that uniform wheat crop, if you're going to do a decent job on fusarium control, and it's going to mature evenly, and all those kind of things, you have to start here. How many guys can actually do the perfect job of residue spread? How many guys bought a reticop chopper for the back of their combine? Do you even know what a reticop chopper is? Right? So it's a, it's a, a short line manufacturer who started building decent choppers. And, and I just got back from Australia about uh, 10 days ago. And most of the combines in Australia have reticop choppers on them. They come out of Saskatchewan. But even the brand new John Deere's, they've pulled the chopper off. Now, I think the, the S690's and the X, S670's are supposed to be able to do it, do a decent job of spread. But a lot of those guys had pulled them off and put reticops on because they, they just, you get trying to spread 45 feet or even 35 feet, and it's brutal in terms of trying to do that good job. And it makes a huge difference. So, Soil temperature is impacted by residue spread. Soil moisture is impacted by residue spread. Drill performance is impacted by residue spread. And early growth is impacted by residue spread. <coughs> and so simple things like having new knives in the chopper will make your spread pattern go wider. How many people have actually read the combine manual about how to change the width of spread on the, the, the stover coming out the back. Put up your hand if you actually read the combine manual. Yeah. Isn't that, we're all, we're all got men, eh? Or no, most of us are men. And, and you know, when all else fails, RTFM, right? When all else fails, read the friggin' manual. Anyway, read the manual, figure it out. And the, what I would like you to do, because some of the new, I, I'm really intrigued, some of the new combines, they look like they're spreading it 35 feet wide. And then I look and say, wait a minute, why is it that right at 35 feet and I turn around and come back 35 feet, I get a hump of residue? So they're actually throwing the edges too far and we're getting them piled up and residue piles at the edges. So here's the way you really tell is get yourself a leaf rake. And if it's a 35 foot wide head, you start at 35 feet and you stand about whatever it is, four feet in, whatever you can reach with the rake, take the rake and pull it to the center, go the other way, pull it to the center and build a pile. Just one draw, all the residue. And then step over and do the exact same thing again. And you'll be surprised, do it across the whole header width, you'll be surprised how your even spread is not even at all. And it's just one of those things you have to work on. 
This is you know, kind of what we get into. You can see the difference in growth that we get. I know I'm spending a bit of time on this, but this is one of my biggest frustrations. It has all sorts of other ramifications, by the way, where you don't get residue, you don't get potash, because almost all the potash is in, well, actually, all the potash that the crop takes up, no, that's because there is some in the grain. I better back up. There's a lot of potash in the residue. And now you've put all that potash where the residue is, and no potash in between where there is no residue. And in Western Canada right now, where they're on controlled traffic farming, so they always track in the same spot. She's all GPSed. And the combine doesn't quite spread the 45 feet that the header is. They get her out about 38 feet. And now they have these 14 foot wide strips or 10 foot wide strips where they're getting into potash deficiency because there's no potash going back on the land in the residue. So all sorts of things that it has impact. And don't forget, because lots of you guys, what do you get for straw over here, by the way? Did you sell your straw? So I hear some people say, yeah, what do you get for it? What's it worth? Two bucks a bale. Oh, what does two bucks a bale mean? That's like, oh man, how big's the bale? Is it a big round bale like this for two bucks? Or is <laughs> a small, so a 30 pound bale, you're getting two bucks. I don't know, in Ontario right now, we have people that are paying, well, the, the high, which I just, 11 cents a pound for wheat straw in the swath. So that's before it's baled or anything. Right, so your small bale, that would be $3.30 for your bale thrower bale in the swath. So you're way too cheap. Anyway, is that you guys have way too cheap a land too. I, I hear you're only paying eight to $10,000 an acre for land. Man, we, the, the record in Ontario is $28,000 an acre for land. I know our dollar isn't worth quite what yours is, but that's still pretty, pretty impressive. Anyway, uh, don't forget that you have to also spread the chaff. If you don't spread the chaff, your windrow and the, the, the straw, you are going to have a problem. And we've seen that time and again with slugs and a whole lot of other things. So, so we we'll start off about here. Okay. So just a few other things, and we're going to speed up a little. Uh, I, want to, I want to touch just quickly on seed treatments. How many people keep their own seed? You don't want to admit? I don't blame you. Cheap beggars. You all want new varieties, but nobody wants to pay for them, right? It's just the same in Ontario. Make sure you treat your seed. If you don't treat your seed, this is sort of what you can end up with. The, on the left is treated, on the right is untreated, and you can see just a difference in emergence. You get into dwarf bunt or common bunt, it's 100% yield loss, right? Because it, this grain comes off, it smells like rotten fish. We have big problems with it in Ontario. Treat your seed, that's all there is to it. If you have wireworm or whatever, you might need a, an insecticide. We don't, we don't often need an insecticide on wheat in Ontario. So I'm not saying you absolutely need it, but it, just make sure you treat your seed. So what are you gonna do? Long growing season, you're going to spread the residue, you're gonna seed early, you're gonna seed accurate, you're gonna use a seed treatment. What else do we need to do? So we want higher plant populations. So what kind of plant populations do we want? Well, my data would say on a green area index, my populations would say it depends on planting date. What do you guys, what do you guys plant? Seed. What's your seeding rate? One eight to two million. Who, somebody said bushels. Who said bushels? <laughs> Sorry? Yep. Three bushels? Yep. Three bushels. What the heck is three bushels? 180 pounds. 180 pounds. What is 180 pounds? Come again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When was the last time that you seeded 25 pounds per acre of corn seed? Last year. Last year? <laughs> Smart man, I like it. <laughs> so again, if you're, no, you gotta go away from, from bushels per acre, pounds per acre, because it means nothing. So at least I heard many people saying 1.8 to 2 million seeds per acre, or whatever. It's gotta be seeds per acre. Because with your 180 pounds, if you've got 14,000 seeds per acre. Well, I, I calibrate it, so that way you see how many seeds, seeds per acre. Per acre. Yeah. Then, yeah, okay, so, adjust, adjust so you're, what you're saying is you're really doing seeds per acre, but it ends up being 180 pounds, right? Or more. Or more, yep. 
Anyway, so it has to be seeds per acre. Uh, we we have been surprised at how much planting date impacts seeding rate. And that has been a real astounding thing for us. If you plant early and the plant gets the opportunity to tiller in the fall, you reduce your seeding rates. And so that's all this is. This is early for us. Uh, you can see that that's 0.9 million seeds per acre. And that was by far the highest yielding when we planted early. And so 0.9 million, right, if, you, if you're dealing with something that's 12,000 seeds per acre, you're seeding under 100 pounds per acre. Then you can even afford to buy certified seed. <laughs> How many seeds per foot is 0.9 million? Yeah. Well, 1.5 million is 23 seeds per foot in a 7.5 inch row. So you'd be uh, uh, 15, 14, somewhere in that range. So, I mean, in terms of seed savings, bigger yield, less seed cost. What's wrong with that story? On the other hand, if I go to October the 7th, I'm at 1.5 million. Uh, some chatter in the data, but I'm clearly at 1.5 million. And if I go late, then I have to go high. Now I'm at 2.1. And notice it was September 20th to October the 15th. Notice how fast that changed. Astounding. So most gr growers, they aim for 1.5 million, give or take 1.6, because that's what people tell them to do. And that's the rate all the time. It's absolutely wrong. Because you plant late, it doesn't tiller. You need a higher seeding rate to get the job done. We've, we've done a little bit of work with planting into November or even December. And if we plant in December and we plant 3 million seeds per acre, we can actually equal the yield of wheat planted October the 10th at 1.5 million. Now the seed cost kills you. You can't, like I mean from an economic standpoint, doesn't work very well. But here's just another one just to reinforce that. At the same location, we have uh, 17th of September. Economically, 0.9 was the right rate, but certainly you know, anything in that, that low end was good. When we planted 13 days later, look at the difference in response. So uh, you really have to start focusing on that. And we did plant in November. You can plant in November. And at 1.8 million, it cer certainly was not enough. OK, so just a bunch of other uh, data to support that. Early, when we, when we went to high seeding rates, we lost yield. In the right window, it was a break even. Late, essentially, we, had, we got added yield for that. One other impact of seeding heavy, if you seed early. What's going on in this slide? Pardon? Lodging, right? It's fallen over. Nitrogen trial, right? Wrong. Wind. Yeah, wind from the wind turbines. Yeah, right. <laughs> what it is, is one of my seeding rate trials. You can tell that because there's a little pink flag there uh, on the left-hand side about two-thirds of the way up. So it's one of our seeding rate trials, seeded early. On the left side, where it's all lodged, was 1.5 million seeds per acre. On the right side, where it stood, was 0.9 million seeds per acre. And so we got 113 bushels when we seeded 1.5 million. It all fell over. We got 117 bushels at, one, at 0.9 million seeds per acre, and it didn't fall over. Same nitrogen, rate. same nitrogen rate. Same planting date. Same herbicide. Same everything. Plant early, plant less seed. What was the planting date on that? Planting date on that was, if I recall right, September the 15th. So. Edible bean time, right? Edible bean time. Kind of cool. OK, so I uh, will skip this. Uh, we, we do a bit of frost seeding, but you don't care about that. Uh, so where, where else are we going? Timing of nitrogen, uh, we'll cover that a little later. In uh, split applications, we will as well. We have to do uh, the weeds. We have to uh, look into growth regulators. And we need better varieties that have better stem reserves. Actually, the difference between the UK and Michigan, Ontario, the Great Lakes Basin. In the UK, they don't need big, big reserves in the stem. If your corn gets frozen off before it's black layered, 
it still finishes unless it gets super cold, right? Because it translocates out of the stock. And everybody thinks, well, corn has a great big stock, so I got all sorts of stuff to translocate. Did you know that wheat's exactly the same? And here, we need varieties that have big stem reserves, because if it goes to 37 degrees, sorry, that's, uh, if it goes to a 95 degrees, then you just finish the wheat crop with what's left in the stem. Things, photosynthet photosynthesis really does kind of stop. So one last quick note. Is there any hope on the horizon? And this is a really cool thing that they've done in the UK. This is how modern wheat developed. And so you can see the blue lines. That's the original cross. And the, where they end up, that's Durham wheat. It's a tetraploid. And then the cross to make bread wheat are the red lines where Durham wheat, and it crossed in the wild, by the way. There was no breeder doing this. This happened eight to 10,000 years ago. If this happened today, everybody would be up in arms because it would be called a genetically modified organism. Nobody want to eat it. <laughs> it's true. Anyway, so we got spelt, which became Durham, or which became bread wheat, which is the one in the bottom left-hand corner. Only happened once in nature that wild goat grass crossed with Durham wheat to give us bread wheat. And the guys in the UK said, well, it crossed once, so it really only got the genetic material from one wild goat grass plant. I wonder what would happen if we went and got some wild goat grass and took some Durham wheat and actually forced that cross. And when they did that, you know what the result was? Wheat that yielded 40% more than the wheats were growing today. Now, it had heads on it this long. Honest to goodness, they were eight to 10 inch long heads, but it was this tall. It flopped over and you couldn't bake bread out of it to save your soul. So we've got a ways to go, but it is kind of intriguing that we might actually have some light at the end of the tunnel. By the way, how complex is the wheat genome? The wheat genome is five times as much genetic material as a human. Five times. If you took the human genome and you stretched it out, it would be two feet long. If you took the wheat genome and you stretched it out, it would be 11 feet long. 17 billion base pairs, so a little bit of a challenge. Okay, so this is where we uh, finish up and we'll move on to the next speaker, but uh, this is about where we've got to. A little bit of power hop there, eh? Yeehaw. This, by the way, is the World Speed Plowing Championship. Yeehaw! <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we'll stop it there. We don't need to go any further. That is the winner, by the way. That guy won. So. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>